Thank you, Brian, and thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. We appreciate your time, and hopefully you'll um, enjoy the evening and join us later for drinks and canapes. I also very much want to thank KPMG for hosting us in this excellent venue. It really is um, above and beyond the sort of lo locations we're used to. So thank you very much, KPMG. As Australasian president, and as Brian mentioned, we're delighted to be able to host the BCI annual lecture this year. But it is a global event, and I'm sort of representing the BCI internationally in this, um, this event. For, it is the fourth annual lecture, but it's the BCI's 18th year. The BCI was founded in 1994, and it's been growing uh, year on year ever since then. This year, we're up to 7,300 members, and those members are truly international, represented in over 100 countries around the world, of which 60% are outside the UK. The BCI is often accused of being a UK-centric organisation. These days, it's less and less so, and this is evidence, this event itself is evidence of how that's changing. So we're um, happy that we were given the opportunity to host. We also, the Australasian chapter, have something to celebrate because this month is our fifth anniversary. We were founded five years ago. A small group of us got together and decided to establish, um, I guess, the independent nature of the, the BCI chapter in Australasia so that we could run events like this. Many of the people who've been involved in the growth and the success of the BCI chapter are in this room today. I won't name them to avoid the embarrass their embarrassment, but they know who they were, or are, and it's down to their voluntary contributions that the BCI chapter has been able to grow. Again, when we started, Five years ago, we had 200 members in Australasia. We now have over 500, which makes the BCI Australasian chapter the second largest in the world, only beaten again by the Americans. We're working on that one. But it also means that in Australasia, we have 7% of the BCI's global membership, which again, if you think of it in terms of Australia's population size versus the world, that's a significant number of business continuity professionals based in Australasia, which again is a, is a reflection of the positive attitude to this subject in this or these countries. In terms of the BCI globally moving forward, all of us are, or most of us are individual members and personal certification will re remain at the heart of what the BCI is about and it continues to drive the good practice guidelines and the certification process and make that as available as possible to as many um, individuals around the world. But it also make sure that those members get involved in developing the practices of business continuity. So, for example, getting involved in the development of standards internationally. Many of you will be aware there's an ISO, will be ISO 22301, we hope will be formally published very shortly, and which will be the first international business continuity standard. Members of the BCI around the world have been very closely involved, including myself, in getting that document to that stage, and there will be other documents following on shortly behind. The BCI also, though, just doesn't represent the interests of members. It's primarily there for the members' benefit, but it also works as organisations and as, a, as a, a, a section of the BCI called the BCI Partnership, and that is involved in working with a range of organisations, over 100 corporate members now around the world, in terms of representing their interests and their needs for um, business continuity procedures, practices, and it just an interest in the, the profession of business continuity management. Those organisations help the BCI develop its research line, and the BCI has, in, um, through the BCI partnership, has funded a number of research papers into subjects like organisational resilience, but also boardrooms and BCM strategy, supply chain business continuity, and business interruption insurance. All of those um, uh, reports are available to BCI members on the website, and the BCI will continue to, to sort of drive the knowledge barriers forward in terms of the practice and, and um, interest and awareness of business continuity internationally. That's another key focus of the organisation. <coughs> Clearly, one of the reasons we're here today is to consider how business continuity as a practice is changing. The subject of resilience is very much driving that concept forward over the last few years. The BCI, again, is acutely aware of that and is aware that it needs to stay engaged in that discussion, if not only and to help drive that discussion. And to be aware that, as a concept, it's not a static model. It needs to be flexible, it needs to be adaptable, it needs to be resilient. And so you will find that the work and the role of the BCI may change and the concepts of what business continuity management will evolve, and the BCI supports that and thinks that's important. And that's part of what this event is about today, 
talking about resilience and how business continuity management and resilience work together. That's the formal part of today. I'm now happy to very introduce Dr. Robert Kay, who is our guest speaker today from Inset Labs. Robert is a co-founder of Inset Labs, and they're a company that focus on providing research and strategic advisory services to in the education, innovation, and risk management sectors. Robert, amongst many other hats he wears, he's also the adjunct professor at the University of Technology in Sydney. He was formerly head of strategy in, in, and innovation at Westpac Bank Corporation, so not too far from here. And before that, he worked in a range of organisational change and strategy roles at Bovis Lendlease. The subject that Robert's going to be talking to us today, organisational resilience, was approached in a slightly unusual fashion, which is one of the reasons why I thought it would be a good subject for us to talk, talk about. The focus was to talk about organisational resilience from the perspective of CEOs, and I guess many of us would love to have some time with our own CEOs, our own leaders, our own organisations, get 20 minutes around a water cooler or something and talk to them about what resilience, what business continuity meant to them. Not many of us, unfortunately, in our roles get to do that, but Robert did, not just with one, but with 50 CEOs from organisations around the country. And it wasn't just a random chat, it was planned around the, those CEOs' thoughts and attitudes and active practices with regard to organisational resilience in the organisations they, they led. Those organisations came from a range of fields. Again, many of some of those organisations are represented here today, and again, we, we won't name names, but they represented a cross-section of industries, financial services, supply chain, retail, communication, both state and federal government. So it really was a cross-section of Australian organisations. 